Hello, and welcome to Old Ways in New Jersey. I'm Angus Cress Gillespie, your host. Previously on Old Ways in New Jersey, we've talked with traditional folk musicians from central New Jersey. We've dealt with old houses dating back to the 18th century. And we've looked at an antique wooden street organ imported from Holland, as well as old fossils from New Jersey's coastal plains. We've even explored the story of New Jersey's own legendary monster, the Jersey Devil. But today, we're going to try something different. I want to take you back to the 1940s, to the dark days of World War II. There was a need to deliver troops onto unimproved beaches. So the Navy needed some kind of amphibious ship. They came up with something called the Landing Ship Tank, or LST. It could carry lots of troops or vehicles or cargo, and it could go right up onto the beach without getting stuck or damaged. The ship had to have deep draft for ocean travel and shallow draft for beaching. So it was designed with a ballast system, could be filled with, for ocean travel, and could be pumped out for beaching operations. Meanwhile, an anchor and winch system enabled it to pull itself off the beach. During the war, more than a thousand of these ships were built. And after the war, most were sold or scrapped. Today, there are hardly any left. The LSTs are little known or remembered by the public. They're not even very well known within the Navy itself. But without the courage and sacrifice of these men, victory would have been much more difficult and would have taken longer. Fortunately, there's still a few men alive today who remember. We're here in the studio with Richard Ehlert, a Central Jersey resident and a U.S. Navy veteran of the LSTs from World War II. Let's turn back the pages of the calendar. It's 1943. You're a teenager living in Jersey City. What motivated you to sign up with the Navy? Well, there's a correction there. I didn't live in Jersey City. Oh, okay. I lived in a small farm community in Sea Caucus. Ah. Oh. They have no high school, so we have a choice of four high schools to go to. And uh, I chose Dickinson High School in Jersey City to go to. Oh, I see. And what had happened, uh, they wouldn't allow some of my credits from another school, so they wanted to add another year onto my high school years. So I didn't like that because I already had two brothers in the service, in the yeah. Army. So I quit school and I joined the Navy. Well, um, with no disrespect, you're kind of a short guy. How did you get around the height requirement? Um, I think people lied. <laughs> uh, I passed all my physical requirements, but uh, they said 5'4 was the minimum, and I was only 5'3 and a half. So I, I guess I pleaded with the doctor a lot, and he, he said, okay, we'll go home and stretch and that. But they never checked me again after that, so I think He it was probably a, fudged a figure. You're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so where did you go for basic training? Uh, basic training went up to uh, Newport, Newport, Rhode Island. Um, right now it's an officer's training section. Yeah. Session, but uh, before you had basic training there. How, how long did it last? Well, it was supposed to be 16 weeks, but um, they cut it down to 12 weeks. Yeah. Well, and there was some it, urgency. At the yeah, it was a. Well, they want to get people out fast, and uh, it was very hectic. Twelve weeks. I mean, you didn't stand idly by and twiddle your thumbs. What did you learn? Uh, a little bit about everything, about the history of the Navy, the um, calisthenics, uh, uh, go on a rifle range, uh, swimming, jumping off. Uh, supposedly jumping off a ship and into the water, uh, firefighting, uh, standing a watch. That was interesting because you um, 
stand at a podium in a darkened room and they turn up the rheostat and they gradually bring the light up like it's, like it's daylight coming and you see the silhouettes of the ships on the horizon, you gotta identify them. And oh, that's, that's kind of cool. It's uh, uh, kind of yeah, realistic. Yeah. yeah. Um, what about the food? You said you'd grown up on a farm in yeah, you know, yeah, northern well, New Jersey. At home, you, we had chickens and ducks and geese and, that, and uh, had eggs every day. And uh, on Sunday, you had a chicken or a gus duck or something like that for dinner. So my first meal in the uh, Navy was franks and beans and cornbread. I thought it was wonderful. <laughs> it was a change. Yeah, it was a change, yeah. <laughs> uh, Okay, so just going ahead with everything, your your, your name is obviously German. Uh, yeah. Did you grow up in a household speaking German? Yeah, we uh, we spoke German till uh, at at home until the um, you started school, and once you started school, you spoke English. Uh, and so during World War II, w was your German language, your German ancestry, ever held against you? Uh, well, it wasn't exactly held against me, but uh, they didn't want to send me to Europe. Uh, I was, when I was in boot camp, I was notified to go to the war college and meet a commander. And the commander brought up about my German ancestry and that. And uh, of course, in 1930, I had been, no, 35 was it, I had been to Germany. My mother took me over. I met all my, my grandmothers, uncles, aunts, and you know, what have you. And I was there for quite a while, so I, I was a little late getting back to school. And they brought that up, and uh, so they advised me that I'd be going to Pacific. Which turned out not to be the complete truth anyway. No, no. Uh, <laughs> after I got a, uh, after boot camp, I was sent to a diesel school in Richmond, Virginia, and at the diesel school, uh, after I graduated there, I was assigned to a ship that was going to the Pacific. And I figured, well, that's the calling. And, yeah. and while we were lined up for muster one day, an ensign come along and looked at me, and he put his finger on me, and he says, I want you for my water tender oil king. And I just said, yes, sir, and <laughs> you don't argue with anybody. <laughs> and uh, that was that. But then he announced that those that were chosen would be a nucleus of a new ship, uh, number 495. And it was being uh, launched in, uh, in Indiana on the Ohio yeah. River. And, and be headed for Europe. Oh, yeah. We so so it seems like somewhere along the line, that discussion yeah. with the commander had been forgotten. Uh, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so let me backtrack a little bit. You were sent to diesel school. I wonder why the uh, early LSTs used diesel instead of steam. Uh, can, can you speak to that? Well, I, I think steam would be more powerful. I, I don't know. Uh, you don't need the power. <laughs> you need the reliability. Uh, and... Uh, the large diesels, uh, they were originally for locomotives, uh -huh. but they found they were very good and with tugs and uh, watercrafts. So they used those in the, uh, in the LSTs. Uh -huh. They had twin 12-inch twin uh, V12 uh, diesels, plus three for nice. making electricity. Well, backtracking again a little bit, what did you learn in diesel school? I assume you'd never been exposed to diesel engines before. No, I never worked on diesel. I worked on gas engines yeah. and that, but not at non-diesels. But uh, they explained the diesels. You got a handbook to study with and that. And uh, then the chief in charge, we'd take it to an engine, you'd give you a set of tools, you strip it down, and then you rebuild it. And it's supposed to run after you rebuild it. So, so you must have had some uh, native mechanical aptitude. Yeah, well, yeah. before I went into service, uh, I was interested in automobiles and motorcycles. Yeah. Uh, so I used to use my spare time going down to the local garage and hanging out there and helping out and uh -huh. at the same time gathering knowledge. Of the kind of surprising the Navy uh, put the square peg in the square hole instead of a, a misfit. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> you lucked out. They miss up, uh, like my dental program. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they, they 
examine all your teeth for have you got sound teeth for going out to see because there's no dentist on board. And uh, when it's my appointment to go, I don't know who the hell's x-rays they had, but they took out all my fillings. And uh, the, the technician, I guess, had a problem with his, with his drill, so he's a little behind schedule because everything is timed, you know. Yeah. So he had me crying there. Then he sent me to a, a dental doctor for extraction. And I had all my teeth checked before I went in the service. And the, the, the doctor said, oh, he got a bad tooth there with an abscess on it. So he pulled it. And he said, oops, wrong one. <gasps> they had the wrong chart. Uh, wrong, oh, wrong, wrong tooth. So they pulled another tooth. I still don't know if he had my chart or not. Uh, <laughs> Well, uh, missing two teeth before I even that, got in. That was a terrible story. Yeah. Well, you were assigned to LST 495. That was in Evansville, Indiana, sort of uh, the cornfield shipyard there. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, what is an LST anyway? Can you give us the dimensions? Of this, well, an LST is like a large overgrown bathtub uh, with a little poop deck on top. It's. Uh, 328 feet long, 50 foot wide, and has a uh, about 24 foot from top to bottom. Yeah. It's equivalent to about uh, 105 box cars, uh, wow. trailer cars, trailer trucks. Uh. Maybe like five across, three high, and seven long. Okay, that gives us so a that, good uh, mental picture. Yeah. Um, historically, um, I guess Dunkirk had a lot to do with the development of the LST. Yeah, well, the Germans had pushed the English out to uh, Dunkirk, and uh, they had no ships to pick them up with because they couldn't land on the beaches. So the, they had to leave a lot of equipment, or just about all their equipment, back on the beach. And they left some 200,000, I think it was. It was a good many people left there that they didn't have enough boats to to rescue to rescue and bring back to England. Yeah. They used all kinds of small charters, rowboats, anything that would float. So, so that brought out the need for right. such you a thing as to get onto the beach. Well, getting back to you, uh, what's a water tender? Well, a water tender, um, well, tends water for one thing. Yeah, uh, you have ballast water for riding the ship or in, uh, uh, listing or whatever you have to, whatever mode you have to do on a ship. Then you have fresh water uh, for drinking drinking and, yeah. and cooking and that sort of thing. And uh, it also takes care of the steam boilers uh -huh. and for heating, heating the ship and for uh, cooking and that sort of thing. So you were the water tender. You were also Fuel King, is that right? Yeah, uh, Oil King comes, it's like a combined thing. Yeah. And uh, you're in charge of all the oil, lube oil and fuel oil and stuff like that on board ship. How did the ship get down the uh, the Ohio River and the Mississippi River to get out to the ocean? Yeah, well, we only had a nucleus. It was only about 20, 20 of us, I guess, that formed the nucleus of the crew. And uh, luckily, they have Coast Guard that do the actual running of the ship uh, down the Ohio River to the Mississippi and then down. Because they're familiar with They're familiar. Yeah. That's all they do is just shuttle the ships back. Ah, uh, okay. Um, and they teach us in the meantime, too. Okay, so then the next step is the shakedown cruise. What happens there? Uh, shakedown cruise, you do the, you go to Panama Beach, Florida and hit the beach, you know, and uh, that practice sort of landings. thing. Practice landing. And, you yeah, have target practice in the Gulf. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. We have a three-inch 50 on the stern that every time you fired, the pots and pans in the galley would fly about like <laughs> no man's land. <laughs> uh, what was the trip like going up to Halifax, Nova Scotia? Well, uh, it was kind of uneventful. We, uh, we went up to New York. We got a... Uh, 
we picked up some passengers, some doctors and medics and that. And then we went up to Boston and picked some more people up there and then went to Halifax. And uh, Halifax was the formation of a convoy. I see. That's why we were up there. Uh, we had 75 ships going across at one time. And from there you went to Wales? And from there we went to Wales and that all our, our uh, ballast tanks, instead of putting salt water in them, they were all filled with fuel oil. Ah. So when we got over to Europe, uh, I had to dump all the fuel oil off, pump it off rather, you know, and because uh, they could, they, the English needed everything. <laughs> yeah. That was very clever, use of yeah. the tanks. Yeah. Well, um, surely as an LST sailor, you've heard all the jokes. It's been called uh, uh, a large stationary target, LST. Oh, yeah. Or yeah. a large slow target. Yeah. Or you're on your last sea tour. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, 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 did you participate in these jokes? Or you, uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, you're, they're also told they're expendable. So they, if they make one trip across, you know, it's economically they, they, justified. Right, because they only cost a million dollars each. And so, regardless of the lives of the crew. Oh, yeah, well, that's... Incidental. Yeah, incidental. Yeah. Uh, tell us, what do you remember about the D-Day, the, the 6th of June, 1944? Uh, D-Day, um, yeah. England is noted for rain. Yeah. And it, it, it filled your expectations, so it, it rains all the time. And there's heavy seas, and uh, we were supposed to invade Normandy um, on the fifth of June, but because of the heavy seas and storms, uh, they cancel it. And then I got a um, clearance for the June June sixth. Uh, that would be a or a 24 or 36 six hour period, where with diminish and you can do something. So you decide to go. So we left early that morning, or well, actually the day before, and then uh, mustered outside and get in line and form your convoys up. <clears throat> and you travel out to Piccadilly Service, Circus, which is a 10 miles of circumference uh, of an unmined area. The PC boats, the patrol craft, they went out and checked all for mines. Yeah. And they put Dan buoys with lights on them every mile yeah. so that, you know, you knew where to travel. Yeah. Went to Piccadilly Circus, and then there was two lanes for each beach, a fast lane and a slow lane, which were also lighted with Dan buoys. Huh. And um, you knew which, which lane go. you had to go, and uh, you just took it took it upon yourself to slowly go there until you hit hit light you know because uh, you didn't want to get there too early or uh, be sitting ducks out there and I, I believe you brought a map along uh, yeah yeah can, can we take a look at that <clears throat> this is uh, Omaha Beach uh, yeah this is Omaha Beach this is one of the navigation maps uh -huh. that was, was passed out. And it gives all the uh, inclinations of the uh, sands, uh, depths of the water, currents, and that sort of thing. That's that's kind of a nice uh, keepsake. Uh, oh yeah, you yeah, your memory. yeah. Well, uh, th thanks for sharing that with us. Um, tell us a little bit. What were the German defenses like? Uh, we underestimated them. <laughs> First of all, they had a, a German division that, that was there that, um, made up of uh, cons conscripts and young boys and stuff yeah. like that. So that it was going to be an, a pushover. Yeah. Two weeks before the invasion, they moved in a group, uh, uh, I think it was a 352nd division from the East Front, and uh, all veteran warriors and uh, made for a different battle. Now the approach to the, well, first of all, no, Normandy is just a one row of cliffs, 80 to 100 feet high. And 
in, the, in between these cliffs, they have these, um, what they call draws, which is a roadway that will cut through the cliffs and connect with the roads and back, and there's four draws for each beach. And um, the Germans set their guns up on either side of the draws, uh. concealed, and everything was underground. Even the machine gun mounts were underground so that you couldn't see anything. And then even from the sea, you couldn't see any flashes of, uh, because they were at an angle. I, I get you, yeah. yeah. Well, um, in the early morning, I guess the LST, you held off a bit out of the range of the guns. Right. Uh, we, we laid out about a mile and a half, two miles to, uh, out of the range of the guns, because you also had the large guns and mortars far behind in a line. And and then you could discharge small craft. Uh, yeah, we discharged our LC. We, what we try to do is send the Army and the engineers in first, yeah. the infantry and the engineers. Engineers were supposed to detonate the, the booby traps and yeah. stuff like that and uh, uh, make the roads clear for, yeah. you know, for blasting out the concrete and that. Uh, and the Army was just to push up. Yeah. So what had happened, they got stalemated on the beach because of the action of the guns and everything, and we couldn't do anything. So that uh, they were thinking about evacuating the beach. It was undecided on it. And then uh, I remember the, the destroyer McCook. Uh, they could, they get frustrated too because they couldn't hit anything, couldn't see anything. So they came as close as they could to the, uh, without grounding themselves. And they watched where the infantry was firing at. And using that as a guide, they'd shoot their five inch, five inch guns at that location and blasted away a lot of the. That was an incredibly gun brave thing of them to do. Oh, yeah. Well, then after the McCook did it, then others ah, did okay. it too. And so, uh, finally, the, the battle was won. You, you move in that evening, discharge yeah, well, more heavy vehicles. What had happened, see, like, when they start knocking out gun emplacements, you couldn't uh, get at these gun emplacements except from the rear. Uh. And what had happened, the, uh, all this action with the destroyer and that allowed some of the men to cross the 80-foot open plain before you get to the base of the cliff. Yeah. And then they went up to the cliffs looking for mines and things, you know, yeah. what being mined, and uh, got to the bottom, to the top of the cliff, and then entered the uh, reinf uh, reinforced bunkers from the back ah. and cleaned them out that way. I see. So that knocked out a lot of the guns so we could land on the beach there. Yeah. And then, um, as I recall from your book, you said they, you took some prisoners on board, some, some German prisoners. Yeah, the first trip we made, uh, we took, oh, I don't know, about 300 uh, wounded mm. and six German prisoners uh, back yeah. to uh, uh, England. W were you able to speak with the German prisoners? Yeah, well, on the next, on not those, because uh, they were kept in a separate compartment. There's only six of them for their safety and for ours. And uh, the next trip we made, we, oh, we had a tank deck full. I don't know the exact number, but uh, there was several hundred of them. Yeah. And you did have a chance to chat. And I had a chance to chat with them because in my job of uh, taking care of the oil and the water, I have to sound tanks, and I have to do that you know, nothing is electric or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, you got to put the rod down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it hit yeah. the bottom and then pull it up and see where the water, le where oil level is and that, you know. Well, two of my soundings are on the tank deck with the German prisoners. Ah. And uh, when I went down to sound those tanks, you know, uh, they, they try to be a little rough on you, you know. And my father taught me some swear words when I was young. <laughs> I, I never forget them. <laughs> so I let, let loose with them at some of the guys there, and they all jumped back 
And after that, I, they thought I they thought you German, meant and, uh, and they were a little more comfortable then, and they, yeah. they come around, they want to ask different questions, and yeah. want to show me pictures of their family and all that, you know. So just like a regular GI. Like a regular GI, yeah. you know. Yeah. Conscripts like everybody else. <laughs> yeah. uh, let me jump ahead to the Pacific. Um, you, you, the ship came back to the U.S., you go to Cuba, you go to the Panama Canal, yeah. and you find yourself uh, out in the Marshall Islands and Guam and Saipan and Okinawa. Yeah. Uh, finally, um, they, they dropped the bomb. How did you, how did you feel about that? Uh, I had no idea what the hell it was about. We had an older fella from uh, Georgia that knew something about atomic energy or whatever, and uh, he described it, you know, what it meant and that. Yeah. And that was our first inkling about it. So you must have been very relieved when you... Overjoyed, I think. Yeah. They blew whistles. They yeah. <laughs> Everybody was excited about it. And, and then you, for a while there, you were just <laughs> shuttling uh, supplies back and forth from Japan and 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 uh, and the Philippines, as I as I recall. Yeah. Well, after the invasion of Okinawa, uh, we were moving people from Philippines up to Okinawa, and then when the bombs were dropped, then we had a well. It was after the bombs were dropped. They had the um, they decided to have a peace settlement. Yeah. And. Uh, <laughs> Ironically, um, Halsey had a part in that, too. Um, Will Halsey had a fleet, and uh, he didn't like the idea of just going to Tokyo Bay. So he sent a squadron of uh, destroyers up to check out the bay, and he sent some submarines in cases in the old occasions, and they had to pick up men, you know. And they, they viewed all the emplacements, gun emplacements in that, and come back and tell Halsey about it. So one of the stipulations of the peace treaty, peace accord there, was to have a white flag on every gun emplacement. And when we went in there, the number of white flags are everywhere. Bog of your mind, yeah. <laughs> but we just moved people from, instead of bringing them to Okinawa, then we just took them from the Philippines up to Japan, because they were going to be the, uh, uh, yeah, what would you call them? The enforcers, you know, occupation, occupation forces yeah. there. Well, Dick, in a way, you you were very lucky uh, because you you were able to see the war from two oceans, the Atlantic and oh, the yeah. Pacific. You, I mean, very few people had such a diverse experience. Um, so, when the 50th anniversary of uh, D-Day came along, um, you found that you wanted to participate. Yeah, well, uh, a local newspaper interviewed me for uh, a story about D-Day, and I got a little excited about it, and there was an opening on a, a group going to D-Day, so my wife and I took it, went to England and France, and then uh, I kind of enjoyed it. So I stayed an extra extra week, 10 days in, in England, rented a car, and uh, no accidents and uh, toured all the southern ports that we yeah. went to. Met some great people yeah. And, yeah. and still correspond with some of them. Well, Dick, I want to thank you for uh, sharing your wartime experiences with our viewers. It's certainly been very enlightening. Thank you uh, so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for asking. <laughs>